Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is malignant tumors of the stomach. I'm going to begin by laying the foundation with the description of chronic helicobacter pylori gastritis because it's an etiologic factor in two of the entities I'll be discussing. Next, I'm going to focus on the two types of gastric adenocarcinoma, intestinal type and diffuse, finishing up with a discussion of gastric lymphoma. So helicobacter pylori gastritis is due to a spiral-shaped or curved bacillus that is closely associated with ulcers of the duodenum and stomach, as well as with chronic gastritis. In the United States, helicobacter pylori gastritis is associated with poverty, household crowding, and lower educational attainment, among other socioeconomic factors. Infection typically occurs in childhood and persists for life. And when you get that initial acute H. pylori gastritis, it is typically limited to the antrum, and the gastric response will be either normal or slightly increased acid secretion. If this progresses and becomes chronic involving the gastric body and fundus, this injury is going to cause loss of parietal cells with a concomitant decrease in acid secretion. And with this continued injury and repair, we're going to get intestinal metaplasia. And this constellation of findings is referred to as atrophic gastritis. Another pathologic feature to keep in mind about H. pylori is cytotoxin-associated gene A, or CAG-A. So, uh, these uh, types can either be CAG-A positive or negative, and the CAG-A positive train, uh, strains have a higher tendency to colonize the gastric body and to secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-8 that attract neutrophils, leading to mucosal damage, our atrophic gastritis, and metaplasia, dysplasia, gastric carcinoma. Now, I'm going to discuss in a little bit uh, the regional prevalence uh, of uh, adenocarcinoma of the stomach. And we know that in areas that have a high prevalence of gastric cancer, they tend to have a higher prevalence of uh, H. pylori strains that are CAG-A positive. So, for example, if you looked in general at a, a lower uh, incidence of gastric cancer, if you looked in, in those individuals, about 50% would be CAG-A positive. But in areas with a very high prevalence of gastric cancer, that can be 90% are CAG-A positive. So let's take a look at our bacillus. Here we can see in the silver stain these dark squiggles uh, that are uh, lining up on the mucosal surface in the uh, surface mucin. Uh, they have this uh, crinkled look. I always thought they looked a little bit like seagulls. Uh, and as they are involving the epithelium, we get this uh, really uh, exuberant uh, neutrophilic response, which is going to be causing injury to this uh, overlying uh, epithelium. Now, with time, we can lose the acute inflammation component, or have that be quite focal, but uh, develop a chronic uh, inf inflammation uh, response. And you can see here we have uh, mucosal-associated lymphoid tissue arising in the background of a chronic infection. We've also lost our parietal cells, and uh, we tend to have an increased number of plasma cells through here. Now, mucosa-associated lymphoid uh, tissue, as you recall, can be physiologic in the small intestine and pyre patches, or it can be pathologic, as we see in the context of H. pylori gastritis. Now, another finding that we can see with chronic uh, H. pylori gastritis will be, again, intestinal metaplasia. Here we see our goblet cells that let us know that's what's happening. These pale blue-gray uh, apical droplets of mucin that uh, look like uh, goblet cells of wine or perhaps water to the thirsty pathologist. All right, with that introduction to H. pylori gastritis, keeping in mind that this is uh, metaplasia, which can lead us towards dysplasia carcinoma, let's start talking about carcinoma. So gastric adenocarcinoma is the most common malignancy of the stomach, accounting for more than 90% of gastric cancers. And as already mentioned, there are two types. One is the intestinal type, which tends to be bulky. And it can be either with a polypoid mass or a bulky uh, ulcerated mass. By contrast, the diffuse type has an infiltrative uh, invasive pattern, which can be apparent only as thickening of the gastric wall. And this re is referred to as linitis plastica. Now, incidence varies geographically, so high incidence areas, which are defined as areas we have more than 60 cases per 100,000 population, these include East Asia, Eastern Europe, and Central and Latin America. And in these areas, the uh, type of adenocarcinoma is usually intestinal type, and the region of the stomach that's affected tends to be distal, so the antrum and pyloric regions. <laughs> 
By contrast, lower incidence areas, defined as less than 15 cases per 100,000, include North America, Northern Europe, and Africa. Now, we see this decrease because of a decrease in the intestinal type. So diffuse type will be relatively more common as we decrease the intestinal type. And these tend to arise in the cardia of the stomach. Now, we're going to diverge here. We're going to focus first on intestinal type and then diffuse type, beginning with the risk factors for intestinal type. So uh, one risk factor is autoimmune gastritis, where you get autoantibodies to parietal cells. Attacking those parietal cells, we lose those. We get intestinal metaplasia because of the injury. Again, an atrophic gastritis, which tends to be quite diffuse. Uh, as we've already discussed, helicobacter pylori gastritis, you begin with a non-atrophic gastritis, just an acute inflammation, moving to atrophic gastritis, which tends to be a little bit patchier than what we see in autoimmune gastritis, the intestinal metaplasia, both of these, again, setting us up towards the dysplasia carcinoma progression. Smoking increases the risk of intestinal type gastric adenocarcinoma because it potentiates uh, the effect of CAG-A positive uh, serotypes. Uh, diets uh, high in meat, pickled, salted, or smoked foods are also associated with intestinal type uh, adenocarcinoma of the stomach, and that might also be part of the regional variation. Uh, we also see that diets that are low in fruits and vegetables contribute to risk. Gastric adenomas, uh, just as elsewhere in the GI tract, uh, have a, a risk of progression to malignancy. Uh, so there's an increased risk with increased size. So as they become larger than two centimeters, they become really quite worrisome. And since we're talking about adenomas, which are precursor lesions for adenocarcinoma, you may be wondering about individuals with familial adenomatous polyposis. Uh, and yes, they too are at increased risk for intestinal type adenocarcinoma of the stomach. So this is because they have increased uh, gastric adenomas. But an interesting finding is that fundic gland polyps, which are typically benign and have a very low risk of progression to dysplasia and malignancy, do have an increased risk in the setting of familial adenomatous polyposis. So something to keep in mind. So what is the pathogenesis? we're going to begin by looking at increased signaling via the Wnt pathway. And this can occur either through loss of function of the APC tumor suppressor gene or gain of function of beta-catenin. Uh, other findings include TP53 silencing and HER2 amplification. Now, it's probably been a while since you've been thinking about the Wnt pathway, which is part of the neoplasia chapter in Robbins. So let's do a quick review. Uh, this is from the 11th edition uh, of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. You can see here in the resting cell, APC is going to join with this destruction complex and uh, degrade beta-catenin. Beta-catenin, uh, once it's degraded, cannot enter the nucleus and cause a transcription of uh, uh, proliferative uh, genes. Now, just as a, an aside, beta-catenin also has a role here, binding to E-cadherin. Now, I want to mention E-cadherin because we're going to see that again, not in the context of intestinal type adenocarcinoma, but in the context of diffuse type adenocarcinoma. Now, when we get wind stimulation, we're going to have uh, the destruction complex is deactivated. Beta-catenin uh, is up, uh, sort of the um, uh, the concentration will increase, and it will be able to translocate into the nucleus and drive us towards proliferation. So if we're looking at an intestinal type uh, adenocarcinoma, and we've knocked out our APC, either through uh, allelic loss or through epigenetic silencing, uh, the degradation uh, complex is deactivated, beta-catenin is uh, fine to enter the nucleus, and we get proliferation. Now, another possibility, which isn't uh, covered in this figure, is that if beta-catenin uh, becomes resistant to degradation, again, you will see its concentration increase and its ability to drive us towards proliferation. So what do we see morphologically? So as I mentioned, these tend to be bulky tumors. And so it may be a mass or maybe an ulcerated tumor with heaped up margins. And they tend to grow along broad cohesive fronts. And this is uh, in direct contrast to what we see in diffuse adenocarcinomas of the stomach, which uh, just invade in single cells and diffusely uh, invade into the gastric wall. Microscopically, we'll see glands and tubules that may have abical mucin vacuoles and luminal mucin. Let's begin by looking at a gross. 
Uh, this is a, a formalin fixed resection specimen of a partial gastrectomy. Uh, you can see here is the large uh, tumor mass. It's got some surface ulceration. And this may be how this tumor presented in this individual. Uh, whenever you have a patient who's presenting with an iron deficiency anemia, you need to think about uh, GI loss as well as gynecologic loss. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a common finding uh, in uh, gastrointestinal malignancies. I also want to draw your attention to these two large adenomas that are right next to this tumor mass. Uh, this uh, probably arose from just such an adenoma. Next, let's take a look at intestinal type adenocarcinoma ulcerated appearance. So here you can see this central ulceration, but notice these large heaped up margins here. This is uh, really quite prominent, although we do retain our rugal folds. Now, I want to contrast this for you with a benign peptic ulcer, which we see here. Now, we have our ulcerated area here, and there is some thickening surrounding the ulcer due to edema, inflammation, but what we see in a section here would be desmoplasia, fibrosis, uh, and those invading tumor cells. So it's going to be much more prominent. However, you cannot look at this as an endoscopist and say, ah, this one's malignant and that one's benign. You have to do the biopsy. And why is that? Because as you know, pathology is the gold standard. So what will we see on histology? Well, it depends on the tumor, but here is an excellent example of a well-differentiated gastric adenocarcinoma arising in the context of uh, chronic helicobacter pylori gastritis. We can see here our mucosa-associated lymphoid tumor, uh, sorry, lymphoid tissue due to that chronic inflammation. Maybe you don't believe me that's malignant. Let's take a closer look. And you can see this uh, incredible uh, pleomorphism of the cells. Uh, we have uh, some mitotic figures here, uh, here, and here. And then we have these architectural features with the cribriforming, with these punched out appearances where uh, you don't have stroma between these glands. They're a gland within a gland. All right. So that brings us to the end of our intestinal type adenocarcinoma. What about this diffuse type? So the diffuse type has no defined precursor lesions, unlike the intestinal type. So adenomas for intestinal type, nothing for diffuse type. And what we know about diffuse type uh, gastric adenocarcinomas comes largely from our uh, understanding of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, which is due to autosomal dominant mutations in the CDH1 gene, which encodes E. cadherin, our little friend here, whose job is to hold the cells together so that they don't split apart. Once you lose that, we have the opportunity for these discohesive cells to diffusely infiltrate, which is exactly what we're going to see. The risk of uh, gastric malignancy is so high in these individuals that it's recommended that they get a gastrectomy before the age of 30. In sporadic diffuse type adenocarcinomas, we also see loss of CDH1, either through epigenetic silencing or loss of function mutations. Histologically and grossly, our findings will include, for the gross, we'll see a thickened gastric wall. And you may pick this up on a radiologic image. You might notice that the gastric wall is very thick. Uh, the endoscopist may not see really anything at all. There may be a small ulcer, and uh, the endoscopist may notice loss of the rugal folds. This is caused by what we'll see histologically, this diffuse uh, invasion of individual cells that causes this profound desmoplastic reaction, thickening that wall, loss of rugal folds. So let's take a look at the gross. This is from a section of a formalin-fixed uh, resection. Uh, and you can see here, look how thick that wall is. This is an incredibly thick gastric wall. And you can see here, while we have the normal uh, rugal folds here, we have loss of that here because this is expanded by what's going on uh, in the tissue. Let's take a look at that. So here on low power, uh, you might be, uh, you know, uh, completely, uh, you know, it might be you know, reasonable for you to think, oh, this is just some inflammation. Uh, there's some lymphocytes in here, uh, but that's not the case. And we'll look on higher power in a moment. You can see that we've got edema, and then we've got these small uh, uh, pink fibers, uh, these this fibrillar quality. That's actually where the term linitis plastica comes from. Uh, the person who described it thought this looked like linen, which, as you know, is a devil to iron. Let's look on higher power at what appears to be 
uh, um, inflammatory cells, and oh my goodness, this is the classic signet ring cell. So we have this large mucin droplet, which is uh, pushing the nucleus to one side. This looks like a signet ring. Here's one where the uh, nucleus is not in the plane of section. This looks like just like a foamy macrophage. Uh, and you can see another uh, couple of cells here. Uh, and then there's going to be some associated inflammation. But this is a very tricky diagnosis to make, and we will frequently use uh, immunohistochemical stains to get there correctly. Okay, so before we move on to lymphoma, let's talk about the clinical features of gastric adenocarcinoma. So, knowing that we have some areas where we have a very high prevalence, uh, the um, public health uh, initiatives in those areas have taken advantage of that to use endoscopic screening to identify early lesions so that you can do a, a intramucosal resection or partial gastrectomy uh, and diagnosis early enough at an early enough stage that the patient uh, is, is saved. Uh, this is important because, uh, not the saving the patient, but the early diagnosis, because prognosis depends on depth of invasion and presence of metastases. Now, you might think, if you're just uh, looking at this uh, from, uh, you know, from first principles, that that broad invasive front that we see in intestinal type uh, adenocarcinoma probably doesn't invade as deeply as quickly as those individual cells that are trickling through. And that's true. We do know that the diffuse gastric adenocarcinoma does tend to dive uh, quite deeply. Now, when metastases happen, uh, there are a few things you need to know because these are definitely going to show up in step exams and board exams and on the wards. The Virchow node. So this is uh, when you get metastasis of a gastric adenocarcinoma to a supraclavicular lymph node. And that may be how a patient presents. It may be an occult gastric malignancy, and then uh, the patient notices a palpable node. The Sister Mary Joseph node uh, is when you get metastasis to the periumbilical lymph nodes. And as you're all aware, you can get metastasis from GI primaries to the ovaries. And a key finding in this is that it will be mucinous. So if you get bilateral mucinous uh, uh, ovarian tumors, since uh, malignant uh, ovarian uh, tumors tend not to be bilateral, if they are bilateral, that's going to raise your suspicion of a Krukenberg tumor. Now, because the uh, incidence of gastric adenocarcinoma is low in the United States, we do not do screening. Uh, and most individuals who have gastric adenocarcinoma present at advanced stage in the United States. And overall survival is less than 30%. So now let's leave behind the world of uh, the epithelium and carcinoma and turn to uh, the hematopoietic world with gastric lymphoma. So what we see in the stomach will be extranodal marginal zone B-cell lymphomas of mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, so maltomas. Now, H. pylori is most common cause, most common cause of mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, and therefore is commonly associated with gastric maltomas. Now, as I mentioned before, malt can be physiologic. We don't tend to see lymphomas arising in physiologic malt, but in uh, in inflammation-associated malt, as in uh, what we see in H. pylori, we do. So how does this happen? So you have your bacteria that are uh, invading, you get an antibacterial immune reaction, and a polyclonal B cell proliferation. Now with chronicity, we're going to continue with the stimulation of these B cells, uh, which can develop additional mutations as they proliferate. Uh, one of these B cell clones can be supported by inflammatory cytokines secreted by H. pylori specific T cells, and is supporting that B cell clone's uh, growth and survival. So we now have go from a polyclonal B-cell proliferation to some unique clones uh, that are beginning to proliferate. Now, if at this point the uh, H. pylori is uh, diagnosed and treated, you can actually get lymphoma regression. But if it's not, you can get further clonal evolution, leading to distant spread and even progression to large B-cell lymphoma. So I'm going to show you uh, an image of this here. There's a very similar image in the celiac uh, disease uh, video because that also uh, can get a maltoma due to uh, the inflammation. And the appearance is the same. We see these sheets of atypical lymphocytes that are pushing apart uh, the glandular tissue. And we know that this is, uh, um, well, we know this is bad for many reasons. First of all, there's sheets of them. They're just way too abundant. But also when we uh, use an immunohistochemical stain for CD20, which is a B-cell marker, it's going to show us these are all B-cells. So this is not a mixed inflammatory infiltrate uh, trying to eradicate uh, an infection. It is a clonal uh, population of B-cells.
So this brings me, as always, to a couple of questions for you to uh, test your knowledge. So just how is H. pylori involved in the pathogenesis of our intestinal type gastric adenocarcinoma and gastric lymphoma? And what are the morphologic findings in our two types of uh, gastric adenocarcinoma? I hope you found this useful. Please uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter, shoot me an email, uh, check out my website. Thank you very much.